Welcome everyone to the newest episode of Be Heard Talk. This is where we have conversations about everything going on in race, politics, and culture. Of course, we are still locked down, self, well, sheltering in place. Uh, we actually live in New York City, so we have the state, um, the statewide stay-at-home orders. Um, I've been in quarantine for weeks on end. I've lost count of the dates. I know we're in a new month, but um, this is life in 2020, uh, post-COVID-19, and there's a lot to talk about. If you guys don't already know me, my name is Selena Hill. Please follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Miss Selena Hill. And uh, again, shout out to everyone who is watching us via Zoom live. We appreciate all of you guys. Um, leave questions and comments as we talk, and we'll talk about that as we record the show. And shout out to everyone who is listening via podcast on SoundCloud Speaker or wherever it is that you get your podcast. How's it going, Stanley? I mean, it's going okay so far. Just trying to make sure we got the interwebs working. For those of you who don't know me, which I think are like one and a half people in this chat, this is Stanley Fritz. You can find me on Twitter at Stan Fritz. You can find me on IG at Stan Fritz. You can find me on Snapchat, but I'm not usually using it. So you'll find my name, but you won't find anything new on there. Um, I miss my barber. I haven't had a haircut in like two months now. So there's that. You're not trimming your hair yourself or like no, doing it yourself, Stanley? No, because I know I'm not good at those things. And it'll be really, really bad if I do that. And I love myself. So I won't. So yeah, okay. this is the world I'm living in right now. But you know, um, I'm healthy. My fam friends and family have their health. So I'm feeling pretty good. At least as good as you can in, in, in these moments. That's good. How do you feel, Tammy? You're on mute, Tammy. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> yes, thank you, Stanley. I don't understand technology. Um, hello, viewers. Um, I'm feeling okay. Y'all don't know this, but I got on with Stanley and Selena and like fully intending to just get ready for the broadcast. And I started crying like a weirdo. So I guess today is really not my day, but no. I don't know. I'm here to talk crap and I'm here to, you know, try to figure out what we can do moving forward because the state of the city is an emergency right now. I'm tired of being in my house. I'm tired of seeing people congregate outside. And most importantly, I'm tired of seeing Cuomo's um, name on my feed. I am over it. So, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that, Tammy. And glad you're pulling through. You look great. Um, thank you. So yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about a bunch of stuff today. But before we get into the main topic that I'm sure most people tuned in for to trash talk Cuomo. Can we talk about some news roundup stories, y'all? Yes, I feel like this man. was crazy, crazy. Okay, first things first, since we're living on the internet, have y'all seen any cool Instagram lives? I'm live now, so mine's the coolest for me, but what about y'all? So one of the best things I've seen on Instagram live in the last 24 hours was Little John versus T. Yes, it was so good. That was really, really good, man. That was prime time TV. If you missed that, you definitely missed a moment in hip hop and music. And we've been getting these beat battles since the, the Rona started. So Scott Storage versus Manny Fresh. I think Swiss Beats and Timbaland had one. Mm -hmm. So we've been getting pretty lucky. I think today is Tevin, um, Teddy Riley versus Babyface, mm -hmm. which is different. I can't wait for that one. But that's been one of the high points of um, the Coronies, because everyone's in the house, so we get to share that. Um, and for those of you who are new to the show, the News Roundup is a section where we talk about the news stories that happened through the week, things that made you laugh, cry, curse, or flip a table. So, like, that's the thing that made me laugh this week. Yo, ditto. So I tuned in at, like, exact, at the exact start time between the Little John and T-Pain battle, mm -hmm. and I couldn't stay for the whole thing. But like Little John bodied it. Like where you, he just. Where were you going? That you couldn't see. I, I, I had some. I had some other plans. Oh. I had some other stuff to do while I'm quarantining and out. But no, I, I stayed for like the first three battles, and I was just like, okay, Little John is winning this because I mean he's so epic and such a strong part of our history. Not just that doesn't take away from T Pain, but like Little John has been around for so much longer. Um, but yeah, it was really good. But that actually was just one of the coolest Instagram lives that I've seen this week. I would say one of the coolest was an Instagram live that I did with Nurse Alice. 
Nurse, now Nurse Alice Benjamin, she is a healthcare worker based in California. She is a black woman. And her and I, we had a long, hour-long conversation about what all of y'all are doing wrong <laughs> about um, the Rona and how you guys are spreading it. And also, she asked, a, she answered a lot of my questions about what should you do if you feel like you have symptoms, but you don't have health insurance or you don't have a personal doctor. Mm. Like, she answered so many questions. We talked about how this is uh, particularly affecting African Americans in our community and you know what needs to be done so shout out to nurse Alice if you guys follow me on Instagram you know that she also sent me a demo about the correct way to take off your gloves so that you don't spread corona um, unknowingly uh, but yeah and I'm going to continue to have those conversations um, as well so I'm looking forward to that I also spoke to Slim Thug on Zoom he tested positive for coronavirus but he thankfully is recovering he talked to me about all of the natural remedies that he's been taking, as well as um, the prescribed medicine that he's been taking. So there is hope. There is hope out there. Okay, what guys? He, um, he took the zinc pack, and his doctor gave him the medicine that starts with an H, hydro something. Um, <laughs> and But the natural remedies include uh, turmeric tea, uh, black seed oil, uh, he did an orange peel steam. Mm. Um, yeah, he did. He did a spirilla um, oil. He did like everything you find at the health food store that the Jamaicans sell. He took it. I love that energy. I love those like holistic bays who <laughs> come around with their hair wrapped, you know, and they got a remedy for everything. That's the best. My goodness. I mean, whatever works. Oh like that. I, can't, I can't really complain about it. Whatever works. What is something that you learned from doing that interview, Selena? Well, um, I learned a lot. I learned that, oh, you know one thing? He said he really credits the active lifestyle that he had beforehand to how he was able to recover so quickly and why the coronavirus didn't really impact him or affect him that well. He was, I mean, that much. He said he's been running three miles a day for a while he also boxes every single day and he works out every single day so he was very active and him and i we spoke about scarface who was another historic rapper who literally said i almost died from the coronavirus and like there's a huge like the, the contrast is stark between you know between i don't want to just compare them but again if we're not on top of our health this is, you can really, like, put yourself in jeopardy if you did come down with corona, God forbid. Yeah. This makes, me, this makes me so sad to hear because I definitely spent, like, a solid 13 hours straight on the couch last weekend watching Tiger King. <laughs> and, like, I fancy myself active or whatever, but, like, this quarantine got me straight chilling on Netflix. Um... Wait, can we talk about Tiger King? Because that was a crazy show. Stanley, I know you. Selena, did you watch it finally? Today, okay, it was on my to-do list. I didn't get to it, but I know everyone in the world is watching it. I know the Kardashians are even watching it. Celebrities are watching it. And I think he's in jail. But Stanley, like, fill us in. What am I missing? Tiger King is about white people who love animals, hate black people, and also make music videos. And it's the most amazing thing I've ever watched in my entire life. And that guy is really oh, amazing. It's about so much. Like, it's about polyamory and gay love and fluid genders and sexualities. And it's about tigers and big cats, but also about like narcissism and greed and rivalry. Um, what I really is it not about? <laughs> Honestly, what is black people? Black people are not included. There is not a single black person in the show. Um, Wait, there was that one black dude that was shirtless saying he liked the tigers. Who? I don't remember that. He was like, oh, I was I the tigers, but he didn't stay long because, you know, black people are smart. But yeah. And there's a woman who may or may not have killed her husband by feeding him to tigers. That was an interesting story as well. She did kill him. It was not may or may not. She definitely did. And she gave us a demo on how she killed him as well. So. Yeah, she gave us a demo on how she may or may not have killed her husband. She didn't, at one point, she talked about, like, how tigers, no, that's silly. Tigers wouldn't just eat somebody. You have to, like, cut them up first, and you have to cover them in sardine oil. And I was like, oh, 
How do you know this? <laughs> How do you know this? That's crazy. I mean, maybe she just happens to know, you know? That's fair. Like, it could be a Well, anyway, speaking of ridiculous shenanigans, um, I saw an interesting video that I want to talk about. Since Tiger King is inherently anti-Black, let's talk about what else is anti-Black, which is the bashing of Black women. Mm. Steven Jackson, uh, a retired NBA player, came out with this spicy video this week where he basically kind of tries to give advice to younger brothers coming up and tells them, his advice is like sound. He tells them, you know, brothers, you need to watch out who you nutting in and like, you know, make sure that you find the woman that you love and have your kids with her because basically having tons of baby mamas is a lot of drama. And he's correct. Like, I, I don't know what it's like to have baby mamas, but he went off on black women. He really went, he did too much, in my opinion. He basically said that the thing stopping most black men from success is bitter black women. It's the lack of opportunity and bitter black what? women more than the police. Bitter so, black. bitter black women. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, for people who wanna check out the clip, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Um, we won't yeah. talk about this too much, but uh, I just want you guys to see it and share your feedback with us if you can at Be Heard Talk. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, basically, it's a crazy video, but don't yeah. pay mind to that. Just make sure to uplift your sisters whenever you can because black men ain't doing it, okay? Yeah, has he I'll, using I'll, a condom? What did hmm? you say, Stanley? Has he considered using a condom? Maybe that's why he has so many kids. And <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll, I'll just chime in quickly because I know we want to kind of move past this, but. I saw the video too. It was very alarming, the things that he said. I know he tried to clean it up afterward and apologize and stop generalizing black women. He, it sounded like he had some very negative experiences with the women in his life. And I think that when we have these discussions, we need to understand how we're talking and reflecting, especially on the women in our own community. So I'll just leave it there. That Valid. Is, you're better than me. Before we before we wrap up the news roundup, guys, I just have one last topic that I really, really want to get to you guys about. I'm going to make it short and sweet because I'm planning on doing a presentation later this week. So tune in for that. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about mutual aid. And I want to talk about the difference between mutual aid as we see it in academic context versus in the hood. So first, I want to say I'm not an expert on mutual aid. I'm just getting into this now. But I'm someone that screamed into the void because I've been really anxious and worried about my neighbors. And I feel like the most important thing we can do right now in terms of being positive is not just taking care of ourselves, but others. So basically mutual aid is just the idea that you give help and you get help, period. Like you have resources, that better not be an ambulance. <laughs> you have resources to give or you have a special skill or a talent you give it to others, um, and you get what you need from the group. It's very community-based. It's been around as long as we know. People, people do this all the time. Like in communities, we see it all the time, how neighbors rely on each other for food. They share meals, favors, like, yo, you look after my kid. I'm going to take care of you this weekend, whatever. The Black Panther Party, Young Lords, activists in New York, especially activists of color, have been doing this for as long as we know. But right now, it's important to look at this kind of in a structured sense and see how we can pull into our communities. So what I've been doing for the last week is compiling resources for different demographics of people in the city who need help. And then I've also been joining a number of mutual aid groups all around the city, just to kind of keep tabs on what they're doing and what systems are working for them. Um, I'm looking to plug more people in if they're, they have time or energy to do stuff in their community. This Thursday at seven, I will be hosting, I, I don't want to call it a teach-in because I don't really feel like I'm a teacher, but basically a teach-in. I'm going to show you guys the resources I have, and we're going to talk about, you know, how groups form to be a source of resource and labor for other people. So if you're interested in getting involved in any capacity, whether that's donating, running errands for those who can't, organizing, flyering your building, providing emotional support, please tune in this Thursday at 7. 
I'm going to be putting out stuff on the Be Heard Talk as well as my own pages, um, especially on Instagram, at Miss David if you nasty. But definitely follow our pages to get updates on that. Um, and lastly, I just want to leave you with this, right? We have no one but ourselves. This main segment is going to be all about how the New York state government is failing us in a pandemic. We're talking about how the, the federal government is failing us in a pandemic. And what do we do as people of color when the government fails us? We band together for ourselves. So please reach out to me if you're looking for a way to get plugged because I am more than happy to share resources and connect you guys to groups, all right? One love. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. That was amazing. And I appreciate the segue as well, Tammy, because you are absolutely right. We need to talk about what is going on in New York State. In fact, uh, you know, when in a crisis, it's natural for many of us to turn to our faith, our loved ones, and our leaders. However, as the coronavirus pandemic continues to implode, President Donald Trump has demonstrated just how incompetent and ignorant he is by repeating false statements about COVID-19 and making decisions that will ultimately lead to unnecessary deaths in this country. On the contrary, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo is receiving national praise, as Tammy just mentioned, for demonstrating um, empathy, competence, and leadership in a way that Trump can't in wake of a global pandemic. Apparently, people love a straight-talking, authoritative man with a PowerPoint. But as he is the leader of the state that is currently the epicenter of the coronavirus, um, and, and he is exhibiting what many of us would envision as leadership, um, I can't help to question, are we looking into his record and what's happening behind the scenes? And you know, not only is he being praised as this national leader, but he also became a media darling within like the past few weeks. Uh, for instance, um, uh, the New York Times is arguing that, and I quote, Mr. Cuomo has emerged as an ex has the executive best suited for the coronavirus crisis. Uh, Je Jezebel ran a, a story titled, Why We Are Crushing on Andrew Cuomo Right Now. Excuse me, that was Vogue. And Jezebel ran a story uh, titled, Help, I Think I'm in Love with Andrew Cuomo. So I'm like, and those publications are more so, um, at least they present themselves as left-leaning. So it, it can be very um, alarming, to say the least, that this is the way he's being projected. But... I mean, if we take a really good look at what's happening, um, we can see that Andrew Cuomo, he was actually slow in reacting to the growing crisis. And, you know, he made decisions that prioritized a neoliberal agenda over the lives and livelihoods of the most vulnerable. Uh, basically, as you know, he's battling Trump on one hand, but on the other hand, he's continuing to battle his longstanding efforts to cut healthcare and hospital funding education support uh he's rolled back bail reform and he's talking about um he refuses to raise taxes on the rich so make no make no mistake about it he is definitely putting us in the most vulnerable communities at risk during this unprecedented crisis and that's what we wanted to really talk about today so uh and we have a very special guest who will join us on zoom as well and before we get to her um you know i just want to throw this at you stanley and tammy um you know does governor cuomo deserve any of the national praise that he's receiving in light of the uh, coronavirus pandemic the governor has given calm, sober press briefings, and that's good. And he's made some really good decisions up front um, in response to the coronavirus. And I wanna give credit where credit is due. He has done that. Uh, he, is also, he, he was also late to a, a shelter in. Um, mm -hmm. And the only reason he was late to it was because Mayor, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio suggested it first and the governor doesn't like him. So he just kept saying that that wasn't gonna happen and then did it anyway, but just changed the name and said it was different and said that words mattered. The governor has an outbreak happening in jails all across the state right now, including Rikers Island, where the corona outbreak is happening faster in Rikers than anywhere else in the world. That includes incarcerated people and correction officers who don't have the resources they need to stay safe. And incarcerated people are staying in rooms with 60 person people to a room, sleeping head to toe with folks in there with very obvious um, corona symptoms. 
the governor hasn't done anything for the New Yorkers who had to pay rent this week. He said that there's um, a freeze on evictions, but all that means is landlords are running the paperwork and once that 90 day freeze is over, a lot of people might be getting evicted because of the governor, because the governor mm -hmm. refused to do something more on rent. So the governor has made a lot of good moves, but he hasn't been the best, not at all. Now, Tammy, how would you chime in? You know, what do you think about the praise that he's receiving? I mean, he's being compared to Trump, which is like literally scum of the earth. Um, do you think that he deserves any of the praise? Do we still have Tammy with us? Or did we lose her momentarily? Tammy, you're on mute. <laughs> can, you, can you unmute me? I did. Yes, you are unmuted. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I'm having technical issues with my computer, so um, bear with me. But basically, I think Cuomo does deserve some praise and recognition because we live in a dumpster fire of a country right now um, where the federal government is not even acknowledging this crisis as it should be, and they, they really haven't since the very beginning. So someone had to step up, and I'm grateful to live in the state where that governor was the one to step up. However, like Stanley said, I really want to use the word relative here. I feel like he's doing well, but it's relative, right? Like, he's not South Carolina that's like, this isn't a big deal. Let's close shoe stores, you know? Like, he's not, he's not other mayors and governors who aren't taking this serious. But when you look at these conservative responses, they're all following Trump's wave. So do I think Andrew is doing a good job? Maybe. Like, maybe he is. He's doing more than our country is doing. But I also agree with Stanley that he's not doing enough. And honestly, mm -hmm. I'm kind of embarrassed at our response because as the epicenter, we really should have been taking more of an aggressive lead to show states what we need to do to quell the outbreak. Now we look goofy because all of us are quarantined, kind of, not really though, um, with tons, tens of thousands of cases, more growing by the day. And so has he been doing a good job? I mean, I guess, like in comparison in the States, but not really. No, well, that's a really fair assessment. Um, you know, thank you for that. But without any further ado, we have a very special guest who was joining us. We have Jasmine Gripper, who is the executive director of the Alliance for Quality Education. She has been working hand in hand um, with a lot of state elected officials and doing a lot of work on the ground uh, when it comes to lobbying and advocating for, you know, working class communities. So Jasmine, I want to get you to chime in here. Um, you know, we just talked about, you know, how we feel about the governor and the praise that he's receiving. But, you know, you are someone who knows best about what's going on behind the scenes. Can you give us a breakdown of the state budget that Governor Cuomo just um, passed and pushed for? Yeah, can folks hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so I've been in Albany for seven years uh, mm -hmm. working on the state budget um, as an advocate for New York's public schools and getting equity in our public schools. And what Governor Cuomo has consistently been um, is not an ally to children and their education, uh, nor to black, brown, and low-income communities across New York State. Uh, for example, um, we're actually seeing history repeat itself here. This is literally deja vu for children and their education in New York State. Back in 2006, when there was a financial crisis, uh, Governor Cuomo's first year in office, uh, what he chose to do was he cut a billion dollars from education and he gave a tax break or a tax cut to New York's millionaires and billionaires. Mm -hmm. So he literally chose his first year in office mm -hmm. to balance the state budget on the backs of our children. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we see happening now, this year, is the very same thing, is that our schools weren't prepared to go into remote learning because we knew all of the challenges that schools were facing. Uh, we, at Alliance for Quality Education, we toured schools around the state. And just a year and a half ago, we went to 15 school districts around the state um, and about 10 schools in New York City. And we saw schools that were using Windows 97. Mm. We knew our kids weren't prepared for online or remote learning inside the school building, nor at home. 
Um, and the reason why our schools weren't prepared for that was because of systemic disinvestment in public education by Governor Andrew Cuomo. Mm. We look at our public hospitals right now that are struggling to keep up with this pandemic and this crisis. And the reason why they're struggling is because of disinvestment by Governor Andrew Cuomo. Like, so yes, he seems to be stepping up right now, but he's not talking about how his years of underfunding and disinvestment in our communities have let us, let us be crippled in this current moment and not prepared to take on this crisis properly. Um, and so what he did this year in his state budget, um, and I, I put a lot of responsibility on him, but I also put it on the legislature because we have three branches of government and they work together. And yes, the governor has a lot of power um, in the budget process, but they have power too. And I felt like they conceded too much of their power this year. Um, but what the enacted budget did uh, was what he literally just, like I said, deja vu, he flat funded our school. Um, he, he's been talking leading up to the budget, we're going to have to make drastic cuts. We're going to absolutely have to make cuts. We're going to have to make cuts. And he first he was talking about hospitals. And everyone's like, you're going to cut hospitals in the middle of a pandemic? That, that just really seems like foolish, like the obviously foolish thing to do. So he stopped talking about that as much. But he still went ahead and put that into writing, into law. Um, he said, well, well, there's a lot of money in schools, which is true. Education and, and health care are the two biggest costs for New York State. Um, and so he's like, I'm going to cut the money from schools. And we just have to sacrifice at schools. As if that was the only choice we had to make. And that's simply not true. Uh, New York State, uh, one, we live in the wealthiest country in the world. New York State is one of the wealthiest states in the wealthiest country. Uh, we have more billionaires in New York than any place on the planet. Mm. Uh, so New York's 115 billionaires have a combined wealth of $525 billion. That's, I, I don't even know what that means. But just to give you some context, the New York state budget for our entire state is $175 billion in any given year. So our billionaires have $525 billion more, like three times more than our entire state budget. So instead of asking the wealthy and the 1% to contribute a little bit more, to say, hey, let's institute an emergency wealth tax. Let's institute an income tax on the ultra wealthy as a way of helping to balance our budget. He said, no, let's sacrifice the education of our children. Let's mm -hmm. take money from our schools. Let's take money from our hospitals as a way of reducing costs and saving money. And, you know, we can't borrow money from billionaires or we can't take money from billionaires because, you know, the stock market is down. These billionaires are not hurting. They all fled to the Hamptons, to their second and third homes. And, and the Hamptons are in upstate New York during this crisis. They left the city, but they're still in New York because they want to be close to some of the best hospitals in the world, those private hospitals in New York State. Um, and so as a result of the enacted budget, when it came to the health care cuts, um, there was a federal stimulus package. And the federal money was going to health care and education. And the federal money said you can't cut health care if you take the federal money. So what Governor Cuomo said is, we won't cut health care this year, but put it into writing in the state budget right now, that as soon as we get to next year, as soon as the, the maintenance of effort uh, expires, we will, those cuts will automatically go into effect. Um, and so he's trying to cut about $2.5 billion from health care that he put into this year's budget uh, that will go into effect next year. For schools, he gave them $0 of an increase. Um, and what he actually did was he actually cut $1.1 billion from schools this year. And he used the federal money for education to put plug in that same hole. So instead of using the federal money to give schools a little boost at this time so that our schools could be okay, he cut a billion dollars from schools and then used the federal money to fill that cut in a way to say schools would remain even. Um, and the problem with that is that schools, their, their costs go up every year. Schools are really dealing with this pandemic the same way everyone else is. Our mm -hmm. children, are literally dealing with this crisis trauma the way all of us are. So they're going to go back to classrooms after this long time of, of re alleged remote learning um, with all the learning loss and have bigger classrooms. They're going to go back to their schools after experiencing trauma and not have guidance counselors uh, and not have support staff. Uh, and so he's literally setting up our kids in our public schools to not be responsive mm. to the crisis, but right. to actually fail our communities and fail our families again. Uh, Jasmine, thank you so much for just giving that elaborate breakdown of what this budget is doing and what our governor is doing, especially when it comes to our children. Uh, the, you know, we need to be protecting our children. But, you know, not only that, 
but the governor has also uh, been rolling back a lot of progressive reforms. Um, I want to throw this one at Stanley because Stanley, you have been working for four years to pass uh, the bail reform laws, and it finally was enacted at the top of this year, and he's, he's, he's rolling it back. Talk about the work you've done, Stanley, what this law was doing, and how it was trying to help criminal justice reform, but now it looks like that just, you know, is by the wayside. So can you break that down for us, Stanley? Yeah, so... Um... Last last legislative session in 2019, we were able to pass a bail law that um, got rid of bail for um, almost all nonviolent misdemeanors and some Class E nonviolent felonies, and it was pretty big. The jails in New York State had reduced their populations by 20 percent in the first two months of this year, and we were looking really looking at a trajectory where, where we'd be able to close places like Rikers Island and some of these other jails that hold people who have not been found guilty of any charge just yet, but can't afford to get out because they can't afford to pay an arbitrary bail. And the first two months of this year, we saw an uptick in fear mongering from um, the police, the NYPD, Mayor Bill de Blasio, the Republican Party. And because of that, because of that fear mongering, the Senate Democrats and um, their leadership and the governor decided that they wanted to roll back the bail law. And it wasn't because the bail law wasn't working. The bail law has actually been working. And for those of you who don't understand the purpose of bail, it's just to make sure you return back to court. And that was working. People were being sent home and not having to sit in Rikers Island or any of the jails across the state. And they were coming back for their, for their trials and their court cases. And the governor and the state Senate, and really the state Senate, if, if I'm being honest, pushed really hard to roll these laws back because a whole bunch of folks who are usually white, who are usually police officers or, or district attorneys who are upset about the lack of power they would have now to unnecessarily remand people, push back. And they've really fought to change this law. So what we have now is a system that is going to help our jail populations increase. Um, and because they're, so, they're only interested in the politics of things, not actually what helps communities, they've delayed the law to go into effect until around October so that People can't say that they're putting more people in jails during the coronavirus, but they can brag about rolling back, rolling back the bail laws before, right before the elections in November. Um, it's really frustrating as something that like I and others have worked on for years to see something like this happen. Um, and, it, and it goes to show, like the, the governor is pretty straight up. The governor has no political compass. He only cares about himself and what will make him look important. So for him, he doesn't care if more black and brown people are gonna go to jail or possibly die in jail because of the coronavirus. He does not care. He's at 81% approval rating nationally, so he can screw anybody over to get what he wants. Mm. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Stanley, as well. Tammy, I want you to chime in here because you know we're hearing about everything he's, he's doing, uh, the rollbacks, the cuts, uh, and you started the show talking about how upset you were with the governor. We titled this episode, Governor Cuomo is still trash. What, in your eyes, why is he trash? Is, is Tammy on mute? Go ahead, Tammy. So I, I'm not an expert in state politics. I've worked a little bit in the nonprofit world, but mostly I'm just a citizen here. And what gets me is how shady he moves. Like hearing things about how he's been planned to roll back Medicaid for New Yorkers, and this was an opportune time for him because he is currently high in popularity. Even though Medicaid and Medicare and insurance is exactly what people need during a health pandemic, that to me strikes me as someone who, like Stanley said, is only really in this for self-interest. And, you know, I, I really talk a lot of crap about like what Cuomo does fundamentally, but it's him as a person. Mm -hmm. He is the exact kind of politician that I can't stand. And I think that turns people off of politics in general, because it becomes, it becomes so much less about serving the population. And don't get me wrong, I do understand that, you know, there are jokes in the organizer world that New York is a purple state. Like there are these pockets of deep red upstate that he does have to cater to. And like, I do understand that. But ultimately, 
you're supposed to represent the people. And waiting years to make shady moves and like pre-planning what will get you support on a national level for your future endeavors is just unacceptable to me. I know so many groups that have had to lobby Cuomo, including like Nyperg when I worked for Nyperg and other campaigns that have had to lobby Cuomo to literally beg for basic human rights, literally just had to mail in a request to ask him to expand the capacity of vote in ballots because he's still carrying out um, poll worker trainings and there's still going to be like kind of an election as usual. Um, the Board of Elections isn't closed at the moment. But all of this to say, he's just fundamentally not for the people of New York. Cuomo is for Cuomo, period. And we see it all the time in the way that he plans his moves. But it's also kind of scary to see how far back he's been planning his moves. And it's also scary to see that he controls each branch of the legislature, because ultimately, none of them are stepping up. Like Jasmine said, the accountability is on them too. They should be checking him, but you know, they get protection from the governor and it pays to make moves with the power people in New York. So I'm just kind of sick of seeing him and I want him, I want him out. Like I don't even want to see him on the national spotlight. He's a snake. Mm. Uh, thank you for that, Tammy. You know, Jasmine, I want to get you back in here as well. Um, how will, you know, we, we see the, the state budget that just passed. We see the praise that he's getting. Uh, you talk about how this is going to affect our, our students when they come back to school, probably in September. Are there any other things that we should be looking out for? Like, will these state, how will these state, how will the state budget play out in the next couple months to a year? especially when it comes to working class communities in New York? Yeah, so what happens is the state starts with its budget process and in that it decides how much money it's giving to schools, how much money it's giving to aid, uh, aid in, to local communities and local governments. Um, and so a portion of that is like what's going to the MTA, what's going to New York City. Um, and that happens all across the state. Um, and so now city, local governments and school districts will have to make their budgets based on what the state is allocating or not allocating to them. Uh, what Governor Cuomo tried to do even before this pandemic started was to shift costs from the state to local governments. And we've seen him do it with the MTA constantly, right? That the MTA is a state responsibility. And what he says is like, I'm gonna shift the cost from the state and say New York City should pick up the burden. Um, and he's been doing that throughout this pandemic as well. And so the next step is what is New York City gonna do? New York City is about to do its own city budget. Um, and from my understanding, New York City's mayor and uh, the city council is looking to make 4% cuts across every agency. Um, so that means New York City's healthcare. So it's like a double impact. It's like the state won't do it, and then the city can't now now can't do it. Um, and so there's going to be another cut to education. There's going to be another cut to healthcare. There's going to be another cut to housing. Literally, all of the institutions that we rely on and that are critical for our communities are going to start making drastic cuts uh, because the local governments don't have the money and even the ability to tax their wealthy citizens. Like New York City can say, "Well, we have a lot of the billionaires here. Let's tax them." The city. Can't can't do it on its own. The city has to get permission from the state and Andrew Cuomo. And he's saying he wants to protect billionaires, even at the expense of everybody else. Um, and so what the thing we have to look for is how this impact is going to go local, right? We always say like mm. local government is the most important. And yes, the state government is absolutely critical um, because there's so much power at the state level. But what the state does will have drastic impacts on every part of your community. Uh, we already know like the list of hospitals that are set to, to receive cuts uh, in the future. We already know what schools are going to have cuts. Uh, going forward. Uh, that information is already out there. And so I think it's our job as advocates to make sure it's easy for the public to access that information um, and to build a strategy and a plan to push back from it. Uh, what the governor has also given himself the power to do in this extraordinary time is to make rolling budget cuts. He's saying, listen, this is the state budget. I want to give myself the ability to assess revenue uh, about three or four times a year quarterly and um, perhaps make cuts if we still don't have enough revenue. 
Mind you, two of his dates, that the two first dates that he wants to reassess revenue are before we have any tax filings, right? We push the tax filing the deadline back. So we don't actually expect to have more revenue before people file their taxes. Um, and we push that date back. And so he's giving himself permission and the legislature has given him this permission to go ahead and make ongoing cuts. So this might not even be the end of the state budget. What he's pushing for is to say, hey, COVID is worse than we thought. I'm actually gonna make harsher cuts to school. Oh, it's worse than we thought. I'm actually gonna cut more from housing and healthcare. And what people don't realize is all the years and the decades of billion dollars of waste. How many people in Cuomo's administration went to jail over the Buffalo billions, right? Mm -hmm. His economic development plans that cost our state billions of dollars and generated like no jobs. Like literally there was evidence on the books where they spent $20 million for a project for economic development that created 20 jobs. And none of them were million dollar paying jobs. It was just a waste of taxpayer money. Um, and this idea that he always pits us against each other, right? He pits uh, the housing advocates against the education advocates, against the healthcare advocates, that we have to fight for scraps and we have to live as if there's a scarcity mindset. And that's simply not true. There's an abundance of wealth in this state and there's an abundance of inequality. And if Governor Cuomo really cared about working class people and those who are struggling, he would ask those on the top to pay a little bit more to protect the rest of New Yorkers. Um, I think so we, when Cuomo gives his talking points, people have to look into the the details. And I'll give you just one clear example of how he's so deceptive in his language. Um, I think people have heard of the Excelsior Scholarship Program. New York has free tuition for CUNY and SUNY. Um, I think from the, the latest data we heard is about 3% of students at SUNY actually benefit from his Excelsior Scholarship Program. Um, and probably less than 10% of kids at SUNY at the state universities benefit from his Excelsior Scholarship Program. It literally is a good talking point. It sounds great, but when you look at the details, he actually wasn't helping the students who had the most barriers. He actually wasn't helping students who had, um, uh, who had the greatest need. It was actually a benefit to middle-class families who weren't getting a lot of tuition assistance from the federal government. Um, and people who are making 100,000 or more can now have access to more financial assistance. Um, and so he, he simply, he says these things and people take them as face value. Um, and he's simply just, I wouldn't say he, he's simply lying at times, right? Like, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's a harsh word to use, but politicians lie and Governor Cuomo has been lying to the public. So when he says, oh, there's no money in the state and I have to cut, that is a lie. Uh, when he says we have free college tuition for anyone going to CUNY and SUNY, that is a lie. Um, and so when he says that he rolled back bail reform for protections, it's like that is a lie. He did all these political calculated things because that's what he wanted to do. Um, and he doesn't care that if the people who get hurt in the process are the people who look like us. Mm. And I think that's really real, that his policies have had a systemic racial impact on our communities for years. Thank you so much, Jasmine. We really appreciate that breakdown and for you joining us today and giving us, you know, the insight. I appreciate you, sis, and the work that you're doing. So I just wanted to thank you for that, um, for that. And now, Stanley, I, I want to throw it back at you because, you know, we're hearing the breakdown. We're hearing what he's doing and what he has done, how he's rolling back these reforms. Um, you know, I did some research into Governor Cuomo, and he's a, the typical aristocrat. He's the typical millionaire billionaire. Um, do you do you think that you know because is it is it is it because he lives in such like an elite society, elite world? You know, he married a Kennedy. His his whole family is from like this elitism. Is that the reason why he doesn't care? Like, that's just me looking at it from like an outside perspective because it, it, it really troubles and bothers me when we have these elected officials who act like they care about their constituents, the working class, they say the right things, but behind the scenes, they're cutting us off. And I'm like, how do you show so much empathy in front of the camera, but behind the cameras, it, it's like he doesn't even care about us? Well, I don't think it's, you know, you can be rich or be connected to people with lots of power and, and have empathy and common sense. I think it's less about that and more about him. The governor is an egomaniac, for, la for lack of better words, and his interest is himself. He's very interested in his legacy, and he's very interested in being seen as a better governor than his dad was. And in a lot of ways, he's chasing the ghost of his father in a way that he pushes, like, he pushes his policies and 
and he wants to be seen. And he has aspirations for much higher office. So obviously there's no pathway for him to win the presidency because you know, he's a corny white man with nothing interesting about him. And without this moment right now, he would still be just be a corny white man with nothing interesting about him. But he can set himself up to get a nice cabinet position or if Joe Biden wins a nomination, he can really use that to, to extract as much power and influence as he likes. And that's what it's all about. And if anyone jumps in to try to undermine that or get rid of that, then he kind of goes after them. Because once again, it's not actually about, the people are just a collateral damage. He doesn't care about that. It's always about him. It's always about him. Wow. Um, you know, Tammy, what are your thoughts and feelings on, you know, the governor reelected? Um, I don't know if you were living in New York when he first got elected, but is this something that you expected from him or does this take you totally off guard? I mean, I wasn't here when he got elected, but I mean, I'm never surprised. Like the first I heard of Cuomo was me as like a baby organizer, um, like begging his office to ban fracking on a statewide level. Mm. So that's my introduction to Cuomo. And I feel like it's really been apt. Um, I feel like Cuomo embodies to me exactly why people hate politicians and don't trust politicians because someone can really smile in your face and then stab you in the back. And that's exactly what his MO is, but on a statewide scale. Um, I feel like we're not talking, our communities, this is difficult to say because you know I love this show and you know I love y'all, but even on a more accessible level. Like when we say cuts to the budget and rollbacks and stuff, people don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Like people are seeing that Cuomo is doing good with coronavirus and they hear cuts and they think, oh, well like, yeah, obviously there's gonna be cuts because we have to pay for this pandemic. No, like in, a, in every context, like we need our communities to understand that this means there will be, like Jasmine said, less guidance counselors available in, available in schools, bigger classroom sizes. It will mean that, you know, state services will be harder to access because the lines will be longer. There will be less employees. There will be less revenue and resources split among more people. Like, I think that I don't know Cuomo personally like that, but when you see someone who, like Stanley said, is an egomaniac and kind of thinks of themselves as like, you know, this prodigy and that they have something to live up to, that's not someone who should be serving us. If you are serving, if you are doing public service work, it can never be about you. Because the moment you make it about yourself and your goals, you kind of, you tend to not really prioritize the people who don't matter as much to your agenda, which is always gonna be low income, working class people of color. Um, you know, I, we agree, you know, thank you guys so much for, you know, breaking it down. But the question is, you know, Stanley, how and why are elected officials like this continually getting elected and then reelected? So like Jasmine said, Cuomo is responsive to his campaign donors and he has more, he has more money in his campaign account than any governor. So that's who he's going to respond to. And one of the things that we can do to hold folks like Andrew Cuomo and elected officials um, problematic elected officials like the few of them who are in the state senate um, is campaign finance reform. And what that means is like publicly financed elections, give regular people the opportunity to run for office without having to get money from corporations and big businesses and billionaires. Because when you're like Andrew Cuomo and all your donations, almost all your donations are coming from big businesses, from lobbyists, from a billionaire who told a black woman that she's the worst thing that happened to black kids since slavery. When that's who you're getting your money from, who cares what the people think? Because as long as you're pushing the agenda forward, they'll be good. And we need more people who can run for office and be in office without it hovering over their heads. Or if that billionaire gets pissed off at that elected official for doing the work of the people, that that elected official knows they can run on publicly financed dollars against whatever hack candidate the governor or his benefactors might put against them. Uh, Tammy, you know, to Stanley's point about holding the government accountable, how can we hold Governor Cuomo accountable, particularly for the policies, the practices, and the, the and his politics that are going to affect Black and Brown communities? 
Well, I think we have to start from the ground up. Um, I think this is why organizers talk about the importance of local politics, because ultimately, Cuomo isn't just answering to himself and his donors. He also has to work with the legislature simply because that's how our constitution is. Um, if we are active in making sure we at least know and can contact the people representing us on a basic level, that means the state assembly and Senate, then we can reach out to them and their staff and say, hey, this isn't cool. You know, tell a few of your neighbors and your community members to do the same thing. And boom, that's pressure. That means they're answering directly to their constituents and they're going to have to bring that up whether or not they feel comfortable about it. I also think that on a base level, people are, you know, paying more attention to Cuomo because he's on a national level and we kind of tend to ignore our local politics. Make sure you know the dates when we have local primaries in New York because we need to be voting in people who are who care about our interests. When you look at voter turnout for local elections, they're absolutely abysmal. And the same few people end up getting voted in repetitively who kind of have a safe spot and don't really feel the need to make any active change because there's no pressure on them and there's no competitors. So, you know, pay attention to that local stuff. Absolutely. And, and Jasmine, I just want to give you the last word as we wrap this conversation up. What can we do? You know, we talked about the problem. We talked about how, you know, Governor Cuomo is doing a lot of dirty politics here behind the scenes. What can we do? You know, those of us who are activists, but those of us who aren't activists, what should we be doing? Yeah, thank you for having me on your show today. Um, I want to say, I agree with everyone. One, um, elections are important, uh, but not just the general elections. In a state like New York, primaries are where the, the vote happens. You have to vote in the primary elections. That's about getting crappy Democrats versus more progressive Democrats. Um, and paying attention to local primary elections are absolutely critical to shifting the narrative. Um, the other thing is like get connected and get plugged in. Whether you consider yourself an activist or not, find a community-based organization uh, either in your neighborhood or an issue-based organization from something you care about and get plugged in because all of the orgs make easy ways for you to take action, right? You can email your representative by this way. Here's a phone script. You can call your representative. We offer trainings and you don't have to be all the way plugged in, but you can do your part every time the opportunity arrives. Um, and so get plugged in and get connected uh, to some organizing uh, organization. Um, I'm going to even say if you can contribute and give your dues because these organizations are doing the work uh, to keep New York State accountable and to keep our politicians accountable uh, to doing what's best for our communities. Uh, so definitely get plugged in, get connected, use your vote on um, primaries uh, and election time. and. The last thing I'll say is like talk to your community members. Like when you get informed, share that. Share that with your friend who you're just chatting with. Bring it up as you are beginning to learn stuff because the more people know, uh, the more it's easier to combat this narrative that Cuomo is pushing. Um, and we can combat the narrative that's like pushing at those at the very top. If we talk to our neighbors, we are talking to people all the time. Bring it up. Don't be afraid to have the conversation of politics in your household. Uh, bring up like, hey, you know, I hear people that say they like Cuomo, but did you know he was trying to cut hospitals? in the middle of the pandemic mm -hmm. don't be afraid to have that conversation i had to tell my mom and she was like i'm calling como right now right like <laughs> um and she like mm -hmm. took the initiative and also because it, it's been hitting home right um we had a family member who got really sick and couldn't get tested here in new york and she was like i my mother was so appalled that someone couldn't get a test uh that was feeling sick and could be exposing the rest of their family she wanted to take action so we're in a moment where people want to feel empowered they want to take action and if you can help them because you know a little bit more or you know an organization that's doing great work connect your friends connect each other um let's continue to build community while we're doing social distancing but thank you again for having me i'm glad to be on this program with you all no and the work you do no, of course. No, we appreciate the work you do as well. And I'll just close out by saying this because I, as I started this conversation, in a time of crisis, everyone is looking for a hero. However, I think that it's time for us to take the blinders off and to stop putting so much faith in one person, one flawed human being, um, especially someone like Andrew Cuomo. Because to me, a real hero would not be trying to cut uh, Medicaid a real hero would not be trying to cut funding for hospitals. A real hero would not be trying to cut education, which is 
you know, a, a, a lifeline for a many black and brown students who don't get, you know, nutrition at home, or maybe they can't get, you know, they, they're not in a, they come from an environment where it's not as safe, and they really see these schools as a safe haven. That's not what Akira would do. And I think that another thing we should all walk away from this conversation with knowing is that we are our heroes. We are the people, the heroes, whatever it is that you're looking for, it's already inside of you. And I think that if we all step up and work together collectively, then we can elect people who represent our best interests. And if we can't elect them, we can be that person. Um, you know, stop waiting for that hero and stop looking to these people because they're gonna let us down. It's up to us to be the, the heroes, the, you know, the community leaders, to be whatever it is we're looking for. We are that person. So I just wanna end saying that. Again, I wanna thank everyone who listened to the show today, uh, who chimed in. Thank you again to Jasmine for calling in today and chiming in. And you know, we'll see you again next week, next Sunday. All right, guys. Peace. Thank you.